On this Sunday night, how will Israel respond to Iran's unprecedented attack? Hundreds of drones and missiles launched into Israel, leaving the Middle East once again on edge. The people of the region are confronting a real danger of a devastating full-scale conflict. The response in Tehran. Celebration and unease as a shadow war emerges from the shadows. Trump on trial, the first former American president to face criminal charges tomorrow in a New York courtroom. And Alberta's signal to Ottawa, butt out from dealing with our cities. And stop trying to do my job. The proposed law that would bolster the provincial government's powers. Global National with Farah Nasser. Reporting tonight, Carolyn Jarvis. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin tonight in the Middle East as Israel weighs its response after an unprecedented attack by Iran. Hundreds of drones and missiles exploded over Israel last night, the first direct attack by Iran after years of a shadow war. Israel's Iron Dome intercepted most of the weapons. There was little damage, but a young girl was seriously injured by shrapnel. This attack was not unexpected. It comes in response to Israel's bombing of Iran's consulate in Syria two weeks ago. Now, the focus is on what Israel will do next. That decision will be made by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his war cabinet. Israel says it will exact a price from Iran, but world leaders are calling for restraint. Jeff Semple has our top story tonight. night sky over Israel, a country accustomed to air sirens and attacks has rarely seen anything like this. Iran, which had never directly attacked Israel before, unleashed an unprecedented swarm of explosives, around 350 drones and missiles, sending Israelis who were sound asleep scrambling for cover. I think it was quite scary when in the middle of the night we started hearing booming and we didn't know what it was. I mean, we knew what it was. We don't extend it. We don't know what extent it would be. They knew what it was because for days Tehran had warned an attack was coming. Retaliation for a suspected Israeli strike two weeks ago on Iran's diplomatic compound in Syria. But when Israel's sirens finally fell silent Sunday morning, Israelis emerged to find the missiles had missed their mark. Israel not only survived, but we came out of this largely unscathed. Israel says more than 99% of Iran's bombs were intercepted, with help from the U.S., U.K., Jordan, and France. Only a few landed in Israeli territory, causing minor damage to a military base and seriously injuring a young girl. Iran, from the beginning of the war, wants only one thing, to escalate the region. Until now, she worked through her proxies, but now she revealed, trying to escalate the region herself. But many analysts argued the opposite, noting Iran's attack appeared performative, dramatic and unprecedented, but also limited enough to avoid provoking a larger conflict. Iran did it in a very calibrated way, sending these slow drones, hours and hours flying from Iran to uh, to Israel, giving plenty of time for the Israelis and the United States and others to prepare. Despite the attack's apparent failure, Iran said it had achieved its objectives with no plans for further strikes unless Israel hits back. If the Zionist regime takes any action against Iran, our next operation will be much bigger than this, warned the country's military chief. Israel's war cabinet met Sunday afternoon to discuss its next move. We will build a regional coalition and exact the price from Iran in the fashion and timing that is right for us, said War Cabinet Minister Benny Gantz. Do you think there's any chance that the Israeli government essentially lets this go and, and doesn't respond in a way that risks further escalation? There has to be a cost to the regime, to the leaders, to the officials who prepared and ordered and led this attack. That expected Israeli response represents a consequential crossroads. Israel's hawkish prime minister has rebuffed past requests from allies to de-escalate and seems likely instead to respond with force. The decades-long shadow war between Israel and Iran is now out in the open, and their next moves could spark all-out war in the Middle East. Carolyn? Jeff Semple in London. Thank you. 
Sam Mednick is a reporter with the Associated Press in Jerusalem and joins us now with more. Sam, you were awake in the middle of the night when the Iranian airstrike started. Tell us, what was that like? I was actually standing right here about 2 o'clock in the morning, and right behind me there were red flares that lit up the sky. This was the defense system. Then I heard two blasts, one after the other, and it was likely the defense system intercepting either these missiles or drones. The alarm started going off after that in Jerusalem and across the country. People were basically hunkering down, waiting to find out when these drones were going to come. Some took about 30 minutes, but others were taking about nine hours. So it was a lot of anxiety and a lot of anxiousness last night. Well, people waited for the, the missiles and drones to, to come into Israel. And this morning, what is the sense in Jerusalem where you are in response to those attacks? For the most part, it's returned to a sense of calm and normalcy. People are going about their daily lives. People are on the streets. Cars are going. Less cars than usual. Some people are a little bit more nervous. They said that they were staying at home. And Israel has kept the state of alert on. Schools are closed for at least another two days. And it has told people to be vigilant, although the imminent threat has uh, dissipated right now. And how about the war in Gaza? Is there any indication what this attack might mean on that front? This has taken away attention from the war in Gaza, but Israelis are trying to get that attention back on it because they want their hostages back. They want a ceasefire. Hamas said on Sunday, though, that it was rejecting the latest proposal for a ceasefire. Hamas basically says it wants an end to this war in order to get the hostages out. Israel says that this is not something right now they're prepared to do. So it's still wait to be seen what's going to happen, but the families are pressuring the government to bring their hostages home and to get that attention back to this war in Gaza and to the ceasefire. All right, thank you, Sam. Reporter Sam Mednick in Jerusalem tonight. The United Nations Security Council convened emergency talks today where the Secretary General emphasized the need for maximum restraint. The Middle East is on the brink. The people of the region are confronting a real danger of a devastating full-scale conflict. Now is the time for maximum restraint. The White House also confirming U.S. President Joe Biden spoke with Benjamin Netanyahu immediately following the attack. Biden telling Netanyahu not to strike back and to carefully consider next steps. Our Washington bureau chief, Jackson Prosco, covers that part of the story for us tonight. A late-night phone call between the American president and Israeli prime minister may have convinced Israel not to strike back. With Joe Biden reportedly telling Benjamin Netanyahu the U.S. would not participate in any new offensive against Iran. But the president's been very clear. We don't seek a war with Iran. We're not looking for escalation here. We will continue to help Israel defend itself. Biden reportedly urged the Israelis to consider their defense strategy as a win, reminding Netanyahu that Iran only struck an air base in southern Israel and not civilian targets. A senior Biden administration official told reporters that Israel needs to think through carefully what it does next. It's just an extraordinary uh, example of military superiority that, that Israel demonstrated to the whole world last night. Uh, and I think Israel also demonstrated that it has friends. Though the U.S. is steadfast in its support of its close ally, the White House has worked to contain the impulses of both countries. What is your message to Iran in this moment? Don't. It's not clear whether Biden's warnings may have helped shape Iran's strategy, which involved mostly easy-to-strike drones and appeared to come with plenty of advanced warning. It's also not certain whether Biden's pressure on Israel will stave off future retaliation. This may allow Prime Minister Netanyahu to say, well, my arm was twisted. I really wanted to hit back, but, you know, I, I had to acknowledge that we do have an important friend here that we should sometimes listen to. Iran's actions may also reshape opinion toward Israel amid growing condemnation of its actions in Gaza, reinforcing Western support just as it seemed to be waning. The tension may also prove to be an unlikely win for another U.S. ally, Ukraine. The attack on Israel has prompted the House of Representatives to take up a long-delayed aid package to Israel and Ukraine. The vote to authorize billions of dollars in support could come as early as this week. Carolyn? Our Washington Bureau Chief Jackson Prosco, thanks. Well, as mentioned, one remarkable aspect of Iran's airstrikes against Israel is the fact that it's the first time that it's happened. But for years, Iran has been funding other groups that have been attacking Israel in a shadow war. Redmond Shannon takes a look at what Iran is trying to achieve and what it might do next. 
a different kind of fire lighting up the skies of Tehran early Sunday. State-backed TV showing Iranians cheering the historic launching of rockets and drones toward Israel. We hope this attack continues to the point that Israel is destroyed, says this woman. But elsewhere, many panicked about what a war could mean, lining up at gas stations in a country already struggling with high inflation. Iran's foreign minister says his country has no intention of continuing the attacks, but it will respond if Israel responds. Iran says its attack is revenge for the April 1st bombing of an Iranian consulate in Syria. It killed senior Iranian commanders and is widely blamed on Israel. It's not about retaliation or revenge. It's about uh, the interest of the Iranian regime to make sure that it projects uh, deterrence capacities so it could continue its aggression and expansion policy across the Middle East. Iran denies Israel's right to exist, funding Hamas, Hezbollah and other proxies for years. But its government needed to consider the consequences of a direct war with a country backed by the United States, making sure Israel knew the attacks were coming so it and its allies could more easily intercept the attack. Whereby Iran sends missiles that don't cause any casualties but still show some sort of strength and Biden wins by intercepting nearly every single single one of those missiles. Analyst Sami Hamdi says Iran's move will prove popular across the Middle East. What Iran wants to show is that in firing those missiles, it is the only Muslim power standing up realistically for the Palestinians. Ultimately, Iran is gambling that the U.S. will be able to stop Israel from hitting back. If Israel ignores Washington, the Tehran regime will have some very sobering decisions to make. Carolyn? Redmond Shannon in London, thank you. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau also condemned Iran's attack last night while reaffirming his support for Israel. Mackenzie Gray has more on the Canadian reaction and the Canadians in the region. I woke up at 3 in the morning because we did get word that 400 uh, missiles were headed towards us. That's Tal Ben Simon, one of the 35,000 Canadians living in Israel. She says the country's been on high alert for the past number of days, waiting for an Iranian attack. So last night for me wasn't, wasn't, wasn't the end of the world, even though it almost was. Last night's address from the Prime Minister at the annual parliamentary press gallery dinner would normally be full of jokes, but it took a serious turn. These attacks demonstrate yet again the Iranian regime's disregard for peace and stability in the region. We support Israel's right to defend itself and its people from these attacks. Justin Trudeau quickly leaving to focus on Iran's attack on Israel, meeting with his national security team and with the G7 today. The leaders from the group of advanced economies saying in a statement, we express our full solidarity and support to Israel and its people and reaffirm our commitment towards its security. The Canadian government has warned against traveling to Israel, which just got tougher as Air Canada cancelled its Toronto to Tel Aviv flights, blaming government and regulatory restrictions outside of their control. The airline just reinstated the flight after a six-month hiatus just a few days ago. Israel and many other Middle Eastern countries closed their airspace last night, but have now reopened it after the Iranian attack took place. But that could change once again if Israel decides to retaliate. Mackenzie Gray, Global News, Ottawa. Donald Trump and his historic trial coming up. The alleged hush money payments, the risk of imprisonment, and the ramifications for his presidential campaign. Plus, Alberta looks to block Ottawa from dealing directly with its cities. How Premier Smith is pushing back. Australia's Prime Minister was among those laying flowers near a mall in Sydney where a man fatally stabbed six people on Saturday. At least 12 others were injured in the attack, including a nine-month-old baby. Police say the suspect, who was also killed, was known to them, and the attack is not terrorist-related. History will unfold in New York tomorrow as Donald Trump becomes the first former American president to face a criminal trial. Trump is facing 34 counts of falsifying business records relating to hush money payments to an adult film star, something prosecutors allege was done to influence the 2016 election. 
Reggie Cicchini is in New York for us tonight with more on what we can expect. Reggie. Carolyn, for the last few days, Donald Trump tried a series of last ditch legal maneuvers to try and stall this trial, but all of them failed. So tomorrow in the courthouse behind me, jury selection will begin. In a case summary from last week, the presiding judge made it clear that this is a trial about election interference. Donald Trump's alleged to have falsified business records to conceal payments made to adult film star Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election to buy her silence about an alleged affair. Prospective jurors will have to answer a lengthy questionnaire that includes questions like where do you get your news from and do you have feelings about Donald Trump that could interfere with the ability to be fair and impartial. Now, while this may be the least serious of the criminal proceedings against Trump, it doesn't make it any less damaging, putting his word against those of some of his closest former associates. I think the biggest issue of credibility, of course, is Donald Trump's. There are records, there are checks uh, and business records. Uh, and what is their defense going to be? Key witnesses are expected to include Stormy Daniels and Trump's former fixer Michael Cohen, who allegedly facilitated the payments. The trial is expected to last about six or eight weeks, and Trump has to be in court, but there will not be hearings on Wednesdays, which allows Trump to hold campaign events. Now, if Trump is convicted, he faces up to four years for each of the 34 charges that he faces, but legal experts say given his age and lack of prior convictions, jail time is unlikely. Carolyn. Reggie Cicchini in New York for us tonight. Thank you. Ahead, Alberta's premier tells Ottawa to stay out of their yard. How the province is trying to block federal deals with municipal governments. Alberta is butting heads with the federal government yet again, this time over municipal matters. Premier Daniel Smith is accusing Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of encroaching on her jurisdiction by working directly with municipalities to solve the housing crisis. Now, as Blake Law reports, a proposed provincial law is trying to make Alberta the gatekeeper. <laughs> Alberta is telling Ottawa to stay out of its backyard. Federal politicians and the Prime Minister in particular, should do his job and stop trying to do my job. Premier Danielle Smith rolling out her Provincial Priorities Act, a law that would prevent the federal government from cutting deals directly with Alberta municipalities unless the province approves. We are taking back more of our jurisdictional control. It comes after weeks of federal housing announcements in communities across the country, many of those funding agreements made directly with local governments. We are there to work hand in hand in full respect with those provinces who want to solve the problem and ask those provinces that don't want to solve the problem to just get out of the way. New homes are desperately needed in Alberta, which recorded its biggest population spike ever last year. Calgary's mayor worried this new legislation will add another layer of red tape. Mom and dad are fighting and the kids are stuck in the middle and I'm getting very tired of it. But the new law wouldn't stop there. It includes other entities under provincial jurisdiction like education boards, regional health authorities and post-secondary institutions. Smith concerned the feds may be imposing an ideological agenda at Alberta universities. How are they politically interfering by using their federal spending power to fund certain research projects? I mean, that's, that's what we're worried about. The province says it will consult with affected stakeholders like universities this summer, with the law itself coming into force sometime next year. Blake Law, Global News, Calgary. The closures, restrictions and isolation at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic were tough for everyone. And it seems a famous parrot in the Maritimes was affected as well. His name is Merlin, and he's now bound for a new home with hopes that a change of scenery will raise his spirits. Heidi Petrachik reports on the final farewell to a museum mascot. For almost 20 years, Merlin has greeted visitors to Halifax's Maritime Museum of the Atlantic. He was featured in an exhibit that we had about pets at sea. And from that moment on, they decided that this was a perfect mascot for the Maritime Museum. The hybrid rainbow macaw isn't shy. I would say he's cheeky. I think that's the way I would best describe him. But when the pandemic forced the museum to close temporarily, the previously perky parrot started showing signs of depression. 
Even after reopening, it was clear something was wrong. He's definitely stressed. He's been plucking at his feathers. Um, so we really decided sort of in the last year that maybe there was a better place for Merlin. That place, Safari Niagara, an accredited zoo in Fort Erie, Ontario. They're highly, highly social um, animals. So Merlin's future home has plenty of feathered friends. Introductions will be gradual and could take months, although there is hope Merlin might eventually make a macaw love connection. We'll know fairly quickly if we're going to see some sparks fly, but all in due time. I hope you'll be a very good boy, just like you were for us. As his time in Nova Scotia draws to a close, fans are sending in tributes and flocking to the museum to say farewell. We'll be sad to see him go, but, but we're happy for him too. I mean, he's beautiful and he deserves to have the best life he can. Since macaws can live up to 85 years, at only 22, Merlin has plenty of life left to live. About to leave his old perch behind for a whole new adventure. Heidi Petrachik, Global News, Halifax. Good luck, Merlin. And that is Global National for this Sunday night. I'm Carolyn Jarvis. Tonight's Your Canada is Cottonwood Island Nature Park in Prince George, British Columbia. We love seeing Your Canada. Please keep emailing your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Donna will be back with you tomorrow. Have a great night.